This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at microbeworld.org slash TWIM. Hi, everybody. Before we start this episode of TWIM, I just wanted to tell you about some audio difficulties that you'll hear on Michael Schmidt's end. You'll hear his voice dropping out periodically. There was nothing we could do about this in editing. I do think you'll be able to understand most of the content, but I just wanted to warn you because it's very annoying. And I also want to apologize. And as always, enjoy this TWIM. Thanks. This week in microbiology, episode number 66, recorded on October 8th, 2013. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to TWIM, the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today from Small Things Considered, Elio Schechter. Howdy. Welcome back. Thank you very much. I had a good time. I've been away a while. I had a little yeah, break. Yeah, I was in Europe and I was at the University of Chicago, which is a terrific place, as everybody knows. And all is well? You had wonderful travels? Yeah, yeah. Enjoyed it. How's your microbiome? <laughs> <laughs> Regular. <laughs> <laughs> what a question. Also joining us today from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Michelle Swanson. Hello. How have you been? great and and michigan is treating you well oh yeah i've got great colleagues here great students how do you and, like the um, government shutdown well it's um i was supposed to have a grant reviewed this week so yeah they're all done they're all closed yep kathy spindler is supposed to be going in a couple weeks mm. last week was virology study section it was canceled yeah it's not good and the stock market is uh having a rough day today yeah do you follow the stock market? Apparently, I do. Sounds like it. <laughs> you know, people who play golf often follow the stock market. Right? Why is that? And, yeah, we, we could argue which you have more control over. We, <laughs> why is that? Because I think you, when you play golf, you have a lot of time to talk on the, uh, on the links there. And a lot of business gets done. That's what I understand. I'm not a golfer. What's your handicap, yeah. Michelle? Oh, that's a personal question. <laughs> it's, like, <laughs> it's like saying, how old are you, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I play, I play, I aspire to play bogey golf. I'll, I'll say that much. Okay, that's great. <laughs> also joining us today from the Medical University of South Carolina, Michael Schmidt. Hello, everybody. What's your handicap, Michael? <laughs> uh, it's greater than my age by a factor of three. <laughs> well, that's not possible. See, so you're 32 years old, right? Absolutely. <laughs> that's what you look like anyway. Now, I, you know, golf, I play once every five years, whether I have to or not. It's generally <laughs> when someone says, let's go play golf. And I say, okay, we'll, well go play golf. Well, I have golf. a tea time at five o'clock, so let's get this rolling. Five uh -oh. o'clock, but you have three hours. <laughs> yeah. Are you okay. actually going to play golf today? Yeah, it's my women's league. How nice. That is just great. All right. So we have our marching orders. Let's get going here. We have two papers today, but before we, we do the papers, um, a couple of weeks ago, Elio had suggested that we discuss something, and we're finally getting around to it. And tell us about that, Elio. Well, it's the word microbiome, which everybody knows. It appears on the front page of the paper these days. What does it mean? It turns out that there are two meanings which are used currently, and I don't know which one is right, and I believe there should be just one. The two meanings are A, the assemblage of bacteria within a host, and B, the genes thereof. In other words, one refers to the bacteria, the other refers to the, the uh, genomes in the the aggregate of all the genomes. Hmm. Now the term was uh, in, was introduced by Joshua Lederberg, who didn't really define it. But anyhow, let's argue. Let's talk about this. Which do you prefer? Which should be the the, the real term? They can't be both. By the way, that's they're mutually in, not compatible. Hmm. What do you think? Someone can go first. I'm going to suggest a third variant. Um, I actually think it's um, because it's it's a real time event. I think it's actually the reflection of what genes are actually 
being transcribed both by the host as a consequence of the transcriptic activity of the microbes. Hmm. Gee, that's a brand new one. I never heard of that. Well, I just came back from the Infectious Disease Society's ID week, and there were a lot of sessions on uh, stool transplantation and how you can effectively come up with a minimal set of bacteria to effectively do things. But I think what we learned at the general meeting of our society back in May is people are looking at the transcriptional activity of the microbiome. And I'm falling on Alios camp in terms of, I think it's the genetic makeup of the microbes. Now, wait a minute. I didn't say what I prefer. <laughs> oh, okay. I, I, I vote for, I vote for uh, B. I'll be the first to vote. I vote for definition B where it's the, the genomes, means, okay. the genomes, but, but, because I think it's this dynamic equilibrium between the genetic events that the microbe is responding to. And a lot of the discussions last week um, at IDSA were about perturbations to the host that then result in bad actions. And they were talking a lot about Clostridium difficile and yeah, but the elite. wait, wait. We're talking about the word microbiome. If you right. say microbiome, you don't mean Clostridium difficile. You no. mean something else. So that's why don't you stick to that? We'll we'll. All right, I'll, sti I'll <laughs> stick. What to, are the I'll other? Sti what did, what the I'll other two people? The, the genomes and their respective gene products, the, okay, the transcriptome yeah. activity. Well, I didn't. Okay, that's All not right. the exact. I, Let's see. I go with the the biology. The population of cells mm -hmm. so a community yeah i'm looking at the definition of biome and a biome are communities of plants animals organisms so i bet joshua had in mind the community of bacteria or microbes so i would go with the the cells also well, one of the reasons I believe he had to is because at the time he did, the sequencing had just was just emerging, and uh, he had no way of dealing with with an aggregate of genomes because there weren't any available. But uh, I uh, I agree with that. I also think that um, the term ref should refer to the aggregate population. However, it introduces one little problem, namely that it becomes synonymous with microbiota. Mm -hmm. So it, in that sense, it, you can argue it's redundant because you can refer to the bugs, the populations, the microbiota, and you could, if you wanted, refer to the microbiome as the aggregate of all the genes. Uh, I don't agree with Michael that this should include transcription. I mean, that's another, that's another story that's called the transcriptome. Or I I think just the, the, the term has to be very simple and very crisp. So I wouldn't add anything more. What's the difference between itself. the microbiome and the microbiota? Well, by definition A, it's the same thing. Okay. That's that's the problem. Yeah. Well, that if you if you want it not to be redundant, you could say let's liberate microbiome and use it for something else like the genes. You could do that. But uh, by the way, I don't know that anybody is in charge. <laughs> right. just, no, no one's well, in charge. Just voice, the, voicing, voicing an opinion here. And I think that maybe what we should do is to have a plea for whatever constituted body can decide on nomenclature like this to go ahead and, and settle it because it, it, shouldn't be, it shouldn't be lying loose is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. I've seen both definitions in print. And that's not right. It's one or the other. Interesting. Well, I'm going to do something uh, that we can do here with social media. I'm going to put a poll up and see what our listeners think. All right. That's, well, that's good. good. So I'm going to say, what is the microbiome? A, the microbes. B, the genes of the microbes. C, something else. What do you think of right. that? Good. And that's we'll, good. We'll see what people... Because I did that with our viruses alive uh -huh. a, long, a long time ago. Hey, what came out? Are they... <laughs> so uh, I've had over 5,000 replies. Half of the people think that they are not, and about 30% think they are, and the rest think they're something else. Okay. But it's one of the most popular pages on my blog. 
it, to right. this day, people continue to visit it. So we'll put this up and see what happens. Terrific. Terrific. All right, on to science. Uh, the okay. first paper is Alios from Journal of Bacteriology. Wow. Yeah. Well, this is a a choice of a paper from a large subject. Let me let me let me say first. Uh, I've been a microbiologist for a long time, okay, and I claim to know something about it. I know I knew until I read about it very little about the subject, which is outer membrane vesicles. Okay, so this happens in microbiology. It just shows you how extensive a field it is. Outer membrane vesicles are blebs, which many, perhaps most, gram negatives form. That is, the outer membrane blebs out into a um, round sphere, which gets detached from the cell and is known as the outer membrane vesicle. These are the subject of a lot of work. In fact, there's a whole book about them. There's umpteen review articles. It is a very, very important topic. And I... There's even a society. <laughs> there is? No yes. kidding. Yes. What are they called? The Bleb Society? It's, I'll, I'll look it up in my email. It's the Vesicle Society something. Oh, okay. are you a member? I'm not. I was encouraged to attend a meeting. We have published on this topic. so. Oh, oh yeah. great. So you should be talking about it. No, no. I'd... <laughs> so anyhow, <laughs> anyhow the par this particular paper I selected because it seemed to be, um, it's about the proteins uh, that are carried by the vesicles, and it seems to have been done with particular finesse. I'll get into that in a minute, but let me say a little bit more general, something more general about the outer membrane vesicles. Uh, as you'd expect, they, are, they contain outer membrane proteins and lipids and the LPS, lipopolysaccharide, and... Not surprisingly, they contain periplasmic proteins because that's how they're made. They're made as they are made. They include the inside is essentially the periplasm. Anyhow, they are used widely for research and for practical applications. Uh, relatively little is known about how they're formed and what sets them off. There's not much genetics here. Um, uh, but they participate in a lot of things of importance. For one thing, they absorb phages, they bind complement and antibiotics. So these things are not necessarily good for the bacteria. On the other hand, they are a way for the bacteria to get rid of antimicrobial compounds stuck in the outer membrane or to discard misfolded outer membrane proteins and perhaps periplasmic proteins. They also fuse with lipid rafts on mammalian cells and therefore they can deliver virulence factors directly into the whole cytosol. So this, the general top topic here is uh, secretion, protein secretion. But instead of, if, when you think about it, the simplest way to secrete a protein by bacterium is just to make it and spit it out the way many exotoxins are made. This is wasteful in the sense that they are going to be diluted out in the environment. Whereas if you put them in a little bag, the bag has a, for one thing, they, they stay con the proteins stay concentrated within, and uh, they are therefore a more efficient way of delivery. So are, by the way, some of the protein secretion mechanisms which require cell-to-cell -cell contact and go through uh, classically type 3 secretion and others. They go through the um, envelopes of the bacteria and through the envelopes of the horse, the membrane of the horse cell. That's also a way of delivering into the place without diluting it out. Okay. Can I ask you, could I ask you a question? Sure. Is this happen continuously, or is it only reg ah. is it regulated in any way? Ah, that's it's that's what I refer to as being not quite clear. There are what is known is that stressful situations like starvation and a whole lot of mutations do enhance vesiculation, the formation of these vesicles. So yes. They, uh, they're not formed in large amounts as the cells grow. They tend to be formed in the stationary phase and under stressful conditions. I'll remind you that the inside of a host 
for most bacteria is a stressful condition, set of stressful mm. conditions. So yes, they are uh, regulated, but not enough is known about it for me to really make a generalization about it. But stress seems to be involved as a general mechanism. Did that tell you? Yeah, you know, it sounds to me a little bit like um, in eukaryotic cells, when you stress them, they form autophagic vesicles, which eventually are or blebbed off the surface of the cell. Right. And the idea is to recycle what's left of the cell, right? As the cell is dying, you recycle it. So So do you think it's a selective pressure that the microbe has been selected for that they make these blebs to confer to them uh, an advantage in a facultative intracellular parasite? type situation where the bug is not actually on the inside of the host cell, but it's putting its parts yeah, on the right. inside. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And I, I think you can, you, you can argue readily that the mechanism of this importance and vastness uh, in terms of being widespread among gram negatives, has to be evol have to have evolved for a reason, and I don't doubt that what you say is probably as reasonable as anything. By the way, since we're talking about vesicles, yesterday was it they announced the Nobel prizes in physiology yeah. and mm -hmm. medicine? They're for vesicles. Yeah, Randy Sheckman, Rothman, and I forgot the third guy. Oh, the third, I don't know, somebody who works on the nervous system, so I wouldn't know about him. But Shankman and Rothman we know about, and so yeah. this is, a, in an indirect way, a timely topic. Because Sudoff. We're talking, we're talking about different vesicles. Thomas Sudoff. Sudoff, that's right. Yeah. But, but to finish this point, I think um, the idea that all gram negatives have this as a housekeeping function, but then some, like Neisseria, which we'll talk about today, is just the real champ. Um, they estimate that up to 10% of the LPS is shed in these outer membrane vesicles while they're replicating right. in broth. And, and there are other examples of pathogens that use these to deliver virulence factors. So it's probably the case that different species um, are exploiting this pathway for different purposes now. Are we exporting just proteins or nucleic acids too? Hey. So it, in the environment, these vesicles can deliver DNA in their way to right. uh, for natural transformation. To ah, occur. great. So you can see that this is not a trivial subject, and it's to my right. everlasting shame that I knew so little about it. And it is the International Society for Extracellular Vesicles, Elio, <laughs> that you can join if you want to learn more. <laughs> Great. We'll put a link All in right. the show. Okay. Okay. Now, one, one practical aspect of this is that these vesicles being full of uh, immunogenic compounds have been used for making so-called acellular vaccines, that is, vaccines that have something short of a whole cell. Uh, by the way, they remind me a little bit of mini cells, which are a different story. They're much bigger. Mini cells are formed by cell division in an off place, like towards the pole of a rotary bacterium, but um, they also share practical interest. They're also used for vaccine making. Anyhow, I, I read someplace that 80 million doses of vesicle-based vaccines have been given hmm. to uh, for meningo anti-meningococcal uh, prophylaxis. They don't work. They're supposed to be 70% effective, which sounds pretty good for a vaccine, but not against all strains of the meningococcus. Uh, you want to add something to that, Michelle? Is that no, I don't. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, so these authors uh, went on to study the protein composition of vesicles of the meningococcus. And by the way, there is a whole variety of ways of making vast amounts of the um, vesicles. As Michelle said, they're made in large amounts, but if you're in the vaccine business, you may want to make more. So one way of making is to add some detergent. Another way to add is uh, to add chelating agents. There's a lo lot of ways of making. So I'm just saying that because Listeners may want to be careful when comparing vesicles from one lab to vesicles from another lab. They're not, not all vesicles are made alike. In fact, far from. So these guys made what is called spontaneous vesicles. Namely, they didn't do it. They didn't add very much. They just waited for the meningococcus to do it. What is nice about the study, what's special about the study, is that they quantified their mass spec 
analysis of the proteins or the protein peptides actually so here's what i did something i didn't know maybe you guys did uh, that mass spec is difficult to quantitate did you know that that i knew okay you want to amplify on that and why it is uh it's because it's time of flight and what you have to do is you have to liberate the protein and get it to fly and as you can well imagine it if they're using lasers to ablate the protein spot it's very difficult to do that in a manner that will get everything to go at the same time i see and uh, at least that's the way it has been explained to me, not being the okay. mass spec person. Okay. So well, let's accept that this is not easy to do. In other words, uh, a lot of previous work, which is consisted of making a prep of these vesicles, getting the proteins out uh, and, and uh, subjecting to mass spec analysis, is not terribly quantitative. That may... I don't know, I may make a lot of people angry by saying that, but that's what I read. So they did something clever. They made preparations with N15, that is heavy isotope uh, proteins, which can be recognized easily in the mass spec, and quantitated those and used them as an internal standard. That is, they mixed them with their prep of outer membrane proteins and determined the ratio. Mm. So the ratio, if you know one of the components of the ratio, you're going to know the other components. So this, they brag about it, and for all I know, this is a very nice, important step. Okay, so this is probably the, the merit of this paper, at least they, they, they say so. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I believe it readily. Uh, so what did they find? Well, they found pretty much what other people had found before, only apparently more quantitatively believable. There is a very similitude to this, okay? You remember Gilbert and Sullivan? <laughs> he talks about the story has an artistic, add artistic very similitude to an otherwise bald and unconvincing narrative. Okay, sorry about that. I couldn't help but bring it in. <laughs> Anyhow, the very similitude of this tells you that they showed uh, what you the kind of what you'd expect. The outer membrane vesicles are enriched for 45 of the 61 proteins you find in the outer membrane, but interestingly, they are depleted for nine of the outer membrane proteins, and um, they are enriched for periplasmic. Protein. So what did they, what are the things, and also, and this is something that's a bone of contention, they found that 30 or 40% of the total amount of protein in the vesicles is from soluble material, cytosolic proteins. Now this is unexpected because how they get, how do they get there? So uh, that in the past has been considered to be an artifact and the fact that the preparations are not necessarily clean, they're contaminated with cytosolic proteins, but that doesn't really satisfy them. And they point out that uh, we're, that still doesn't explain it. Uh, and there is an out, namely that in some strange bug, I forget which, uh, there are vesicles made from the inner membrane. Now, of course, if you make them from the inner membrane, you're going to have cytosolic proteins in it. Uh, whether this is the case here, nobody knows. Anyhow, there is this food for thought that a lot of the proteins in the vesicles are from the cytosol. All right. So the interesting ones are probably the ones which are missing. Uh, well, the abundant ones, let me say first. They are regulatory proteins, oral transporters, proteins involved in acquisition of iron and zinc, which is probably, I think this describes periplasmic proteins, doesn't it? Yeah. Oh, and a two-partner two secretion system. So, yeah, these are membrane proteins or periplasmic proteins, which is probably what you'd expect. So, uh, but some of these proteins are known to be involved in the adhesion of meningococci to the host cells and somehow I don't quite know how in biofilm formation. So there's more food for thought here. So these are the, the abundant proteins. So what's depleted? What, what do you not find? What, what is the dog that didn't bark? 
So the answer is that there are proteins, outer membrane proteins, which are known to connect the outer membrane either to the peptidoglycan layer or to the inner membrane. They're called RMPM, PILQ, MTRE, and so forth. Also, abundant porins like pore A and pore B are missing. There are also other proteins, three lytic transglycosylases, which are involved in the reshuffling of peptidoglycan and possibly to the connection of the peptidoglycan with the outer membrane. So the conclusion is that these vesicles seem to be forming in areas of the outer membrane which are less likely to be bound to the under, underlying peptidoglycan layer, therefore less likely to be restrained from blebbing. And this makes good sense, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, but it could also be that it's it's different in that maybe the process of forming a bleb excludes certain proteins. Yeah, that's certainly that, that's certainly right. It, it's possible. It's a, it adds a a mechanism that requires a special yeah. a special aspect of the mechanism. Whereas just saying the outer membrane has two kinds of zones: the ones which are yeah. uh, tied to the peptidoglycan, the ones that aren't, and the ones that aren't make vesicles more readily. That's kind of easy. So it depends. I mean, I don't think these things are settled. These are these are proposals mm -hmm. so far. So uh, anyhow, that is kind of what the paper says, and uh, it's a nice, well done paper. It is, it goes into the background material a fair amount. I I recommend it. It's a very readable paper. Is there a way that cytosolic proteins or in fact, DNA can get from the cytosol across the inner membrane? Are there known transport mechanisms? Oh, sure. Yes. sure. Well, yeah. Most type yes. 6 secretion. So that could accommodate this, right? Yeah, most, yeah, this is type 1, and there's several secretion mechanisms. Well, all secretion mechanisms require going through the inner membrane at least. Mm. So, uh, yeah, and how are periplasmic and outer membrane protein maze, if not by secretion through the inner membrane? So, yeah, it's possible that. Uh, somehow, when uh, here's a, here's a possibility that just occurs to me, let's say that in the formation of the outer membrane vesicles, you introduce a signal to the inner membrane to vesiculate or to loosen up or to do something which allows the transfer of uh, cytosolic proteins and DNA. Mind you, all these things happen probably mainly in the stationary phase where the cells are not necessarily happy and where they can afford to make holes in their membranes because some of them aren't going to live anyhow, and some are. So, you know, it's anything is possible right now, we don't know. Hmm. At least, uh, maybe if I attended the meetings of the, what is it called again? The Society for... <laughs> International Society for Extracellular Vesicles. Okay, so if we can... And the next meeting is in Rotterdam. Uh, I bet you they're having a good time because there's so many wrinkles. Notice, notice what I'm saying here. There's, I, I just barely touched on a whole lot of different subjects. So this outer membrane business just is all over the place. Mm. There's some lovely examples of, of the impact they have in pathogenesis too. Um, Meta Kuhn, who's at Duke, uh, has been a real leader in this area, and she has been studying... Um, uh, pathogenic E. coli strains that use these vesicles to deliver um, the heat labile enterotoxin into host cells, into epithelial cells. And then um, the project in my lab was uh, led by a Spaniard, um, Esteban Fernandez Morara, who found that it was the, um, actually the LPS was the active component. So he was able to purify these outer membrane vesicles of Legionella from a virulent strain and show that if he attached them to beads, and then fed these coated beads to macrophages, the beads would now um, block their own delivery to lysosomes, the digestive compartment. Mm. Right. So um, we propose that this is one of the mechanisms Legionella uses to uh, slow down the fusion of its, of its phagosome with the degradative lysosomes. Wow. By, by delivering these um, outer membrane vesicles, which Jürgen Helbig has, in Germany has done some EM and shown that they intercalate into the, um, into the phagosomal vacuole. So you can imagine they would perturb some of the, um, let's say, the snaps and snare proteins that, uh, mm. that won the Nobel Prize for uh, Jim Rothman. Mm. 
So, you know, when listening, I was I was thinking of another eukaryotic vesicle called an exosome. Mm -hmm. These mm -hmm. are shed from eukaryotic cells, and they contain RNAs. And sure enough, your International Society for Extracellular Vesicles also is about exosomes. So it's That's not right. it's not just gram negative it's a bacteria. Big tent. It's yeah. a big tent there which, at the International Society. Which is good. <laughs> That's how you learn things when you and, so. and just to get back to Elio's point that these aren't well understood, you know, it's complicated because it's lipids. We we type two secretion, three secretion, four secretion, we can get proteins, make make mutations in particular components and break it down a bit more easily than we can. Um Working with lipids and yeah. phospholipids, you got to change point. the genes that ultimately mean so much. Yeah, more without killing the tasks. cell. Oh, without killing the cell, and the right. law of unintended consequences right. comes into play big time. I'm reminded. Uh, I went when I was in the secretion world. I I went to a number of Gordon conferences and had the pleasure of hearing Mary Jane Osborne of Connecticut talk about how she did some of these pioneering experiments. And if you look through the methodology in the paper, um, they describe some of her, her methods. And, and, and one member, uh, the Osborne procedure, uh, when we were working on um, secretion and, back, and the E. coli back in the late 80s, uh, we were making Osborne gradients and all sorts of other things. So, you know, this, this is not easy science to do. This is quite technical and it's it's really hard to reproduce and get a consistent prep as michelle well knows yeah that's true uh it does in general to to maybe sum it up in in the broadest terms it does talk about the plasticity of bacterial envelopes uh, I always thought bacteria are encased in these very tough cell walls, and they are different in gram positives and gram negatives, but they are tough, and boy, nothing much gets through unless they want it, and nothing much gets out unless they want it. And here you have this plasticity, this elasticity of the, of the envelopes capable of budding out all kinds of things. By the way, we talked, it's one of the twins, we talked about the opposite, the formation of vesicles that go intracellular. Yeah. Remember yeah. that? But cavioli? Yeah, yes. so yeah the cavioli. Can be induced to make vesicles that go inside the cell, out of the inner membrane. So this is, as I say, it, the world is different than what I learned as a kid. <laughs> as it should be. As it should be, right. <laughs> About time I learned something, right? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Elio. Of course. Uh, we have a second paper from the New England Journal of Medicine. It's called Diverse Sources of C. Difficile Infection Identified on Whole Genome Sequencing. And, Michelle, were you able to talk with one of the authors? I did. I was able to uh, communicate with uh, David Iyer, who's a physician scientist uh, working in England. Um, he is a busy guy. He's just returned to the clinics after um, completing his equivalent to the PhD here. Um, and he and his wife, Katie, also have a 14-week-old baby named William. But he was able to um, share some information about his, um, his project that I'll, I'll uh, contribute as we, as we go through it. All right, Michael, I thought this was right up your alley. Uh, is is that because it involved diarrhea or? <laughs> <laughs> it's, no, it's, um, it's because everything is up your alley. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's well, it. Thank you. <laughs> well, you know, it's 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 really interesting. I, I I flew out to the coast last week, and I actually sat next to one of my colleagues who was going to the same meeting, and he pulled out his New England Journal and to discuss this paper as. We were flying across the country. Uh, Joe John, some of you will recall, was on TWIM, and he oh, yeah. uh, is an infectious disease physician by profession and uh, a, a microbiologist uh, simply because he, he loves our, our discipline so well. But he he's always very concerned about how infections move within his patient populations, and he was most intrigued by what these authors do, and more importantly, how remarkably the technology has progressed in the in the last five years. So the story 
that is told by Iyer and his colleagues from uh, England is is really a pretty compelling story, and uh, the the take home message is is interesting, but not all that surprising when one c- actually considers the microbe uh, forms a spore and the form and the spores are are relatively hardy. And why don't you tell us? Why don't you tell us what the take home message is? Okay. The, the take-home message is um, they describe that uh, the transmission of C. diff infections from symptomatic patients accounted for only slightly more than a third of the cases in a particular region. And this is in a region where they have a uh, typical C. diff infection rate. And the, the rates can vary in Europe from about 0.3% to as high as 15%. In, in Japan. And so the the general tenet is is that what what had been dogma in the past is that C. diff was a hospital-based infection that you acquired from encountering a C. diff spore that was uh, the consequence of a of an accident in which you know someone had diarrhea and it didn't get cleaned up properly. The spores moved from from patient to patient. And so what these authors did is they used whole genome sequencing. And the tremendous effort they expended, they sequenced well over 1,200 different isolates of Clostridium difficile, whole genome sequencing. And so this is is really a remarkable uh, accomplishment uh, from the perspective of the sheer volume of technical data, and the and, way and, they, and David actually commented they they had to first extract the DNA from all those bacteria. So he kind of wrote a humorous bit about the competition they would set up to um, <laughs> to try to do high throughput DNA extraction from the many 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 isolates that they uh, they collected. So there's a lot of work that went into this paper. And and the other thing to appreciate is now we're moving into the gram positive realm. And recall that um, whole genome sequencing typically comes off of uh, an isolated colony off of uh, a petri plate. And so you're not actually fishing it out. You're fishing it off of a petri plate after someone has actually planted the stool and isolated the, the, the C. diff. And they use the rapid benchtop uh, sequencing methodology that is becoming popular in many clinical laboratories, at least in Europe, and it's slowly migrating into the United States. Could and, you could you ex- uh, could you explain what benchtop means as opposed to non-benchtop? Well, benchtop means the device sits on a bench, as opposed to a dedicated sequencing facility, which. Um, I recall seeing the the tiger pictures when the human genome was popular, where you just have row after row of lab benches with sequencing machines. This right. one is about the size of a of a printer, the uh, popular laser print that many of us have in our offices, and um, it literally sits on your bench, and you load it up with a micro titer plate and. Uh, it is able to determine um, the sequences of your particular constructs. And it generally does it as at a price point. What I heard last week from one of uh, Michelle's colleagues at Michigan is Michigan has actually gotten it, gotten it down to about $40 a sequence for a whole genome. Oh, my God. Go blue. <laughs> oh my I God. mean, I, I was like scary. Blown. <laughs> blown away a whole genome for forty dollars when my price point for pulse field gel electrophoresis which takes whole chromosomal dna from a bacterium you put it in an auger plug you subject it to restriction digestion that takes forty dollars in supplies plus labor to accomplish so i was blown away when i started hearing the price points and we folks- ain't seen nothing yet right and yeah, it's, it's better. It's it's, so, it's going to get better. So the the take home message is they had a population and they wanted to ask a very simple question: the, the outbreak of C diff that we're seeing is it a consequence of patient to patient spread, or is it being brought in by healthcare workers, or is it 
uh, from the community because more and more many uh, there there's an emerging epidemic at least in the United States where it's moved into the community it's following what happened with MRSA where MRSA was a hospital based infection and then it moved to community acquired methicillin resistant staph aureus and so what these authors heroically did is they started off with a very simple protocol they first asked the question all patients with diarrhea and they used the the clinical definition where you had to have greater than stool three stools in their head and this is the this only the British could say this that took the shape of the container. Yeah, I love that. I'm so that, glad you gave that definition. I was going to raise that. <laughs> I mean, that is a a Britishism. I mean, I, I have never, you know, we use the word like liquid, but took the shape of a container. <laughs> it, that that is so remarkable, and it really. Um, it, it gives the operational definition of, uh, of diarrhea. Greater than three <laughs> takes the shape of – first did is they um, did the immunoassay for toxins A and B, which is the operational definition for C. diff-based disease. You need the toxin to cause the difficile-based disease. So here is the one flaw I think that is – resident in their study is they don't have a control per se where they actually ask for stool samples from healthcare work to ascertain what the carriage rate of C. diff is in their patient population because they thought that the symptomatic patients accounted for slightly more than a third of the cases and that's a sort of discounting dogma, which was C. diff is spread in the hospital as a consequence of, of the stool cloud that comes out. Because the other thing you have to appreciate, before for transmission to occur, it's assumed that cases were infectious one week before diagnosis through eight weeks after diagnosis with an incubation time of zero to 12 weeks. So again... This, I think, is the only technical limit or one of the technical limitations with their study is they didn't have a control group to compare it with because this uh, third may actually be less. They, um, the way they did this uh, study is they uh, had a reference genome and then they asked the question about single nucleotide variants. And if you – so these are – base pair changes at a sequence level. If you had greater than 10 differences in a genome, and C. diff is a genome of, I think, about three megabases or so. Does that sound right, Michelle? Somewhere in that range. Yeah. So consequently, you know, it's a very good fidelity if, if you, in terms of replication, but at the same time, if you have greater than 10, you're considered to be unique, not having come from another patient or another contact source. If you have um, less than two differences, you're considered equivalent or I identical. So if it, um, I had a C. diff that had one mutation and M Michelle had a C. diff that was only two mutations uh, different than me. Uh, we would be considered equivalent for, for the sake of their uh, epidemiologic considerations. The other interesting thing about this study is this was done, unlike the United States, uh, the United Kingdom still has wards. And so beds are typically clustered four to a pod, and they're mm. typically between the beds in a ward. So if you think about stool moving within a ward situation, you can understand how when stool dries on a, a bed sheet, the spores could be easily distributed just from uh, changing of the sheets. And so what they did is they did a lot of very sophisticated uh, bioinformatics, looking and comparing and contrasting in order to uh, arrive at their 
it against the former gold standard for characterizing identities of microbes, which was uh, multi-locus sequence typing, which typically looked at six housekeeping genes. And again, looking for nucleotide variants, that's the way that they would uh, declare if an organism was equivalent to the organism from another person. Now, whether that's or not prehistoric stuff, isn't it? Yeah, now, today, it's prehistoric stuff. Okay. Okay. Um, so what, what they did is they look at the single nucleotide variance between each case and the, then the genetically closest case, and they take us through the epidemiology behind that. And at this, I'm, I'm wondering how our young physician colleagues who haven't been trained in modern bioinformatics are going to be able to digest these beautiful New England Journal uh, figures because the New England Journal always develops these great figures. And um, they have a series of four of them in which they describe uh, the number of variants that they see in order to arrive at their summary. A third of the cases were related and two-thirds weren't. And rather than take you through these uh, figures line by line, I'd just like to call your attention to the third figure where they specifically illustrate in a very neat graph the timing and size of the C. diff clusters. And the way they do this is they um, are looking for unique cases of C. diff, which means they have greater than 10 single nucleotide variants. It's a function of time. And they started this study in 2007 was when they had their run-in period. And then they started hard target collecting in 2008. And what you see is as time goes on, you know, since they're looking for the reoccurrence, you see, if you will, um, a random assortment of the C. diff cases uh, that are out in the environment. So then... And I, I discovered that um, the CDC and its Emerging Infectious Diseases Journal uh, that they publish uh, once a month back in 2009 was talking about C. diff in uh, pre-washed salad products in, in Scotland. So, you know, C. diff is on our food and we can ingest it. And so that's why I go back to part of the issue may be with their lack of controls from the well population. Right. Yeah, I was going to say, going in, I'll bet that they expected over the course of this three-and-a-half-year study to find that most of the transmission was healthcare worker to healthcare worker, patient to healthcare worker to patient. And in fact, the fact that the majority was not, I think, is really important. And it it's certainly going to change the way... I teach uh, this to the medical students, but also, more importantly, um, it can help them decide how to spend their resources in infection control. Um, and they made the point that that uh, rather than focusing on the bacteria, they, they actually were having better success by managing the patients differently, um, not using particular antibiotics, avoiding antibiotics where possible so that the host was less susceptible. But also, I think from a microbiological standpoint, we have to really think harder about environmental reservoirs for this organism. We, we certainly have discovered that in our study here, our clinical trial in which we had a continuously active antimicrobial. And what we learned when you had a continuous actor like copper, we didn't see any C. diff cases while on the control arm, uh, we did see C. diff cases. But when you do the power calculation to try to figure out how to power that study to say that copper will be able to uh, help control C. diff outbreaks in a hospital setting years, and because our C. diff attack rate is so low at my hospital, it, it, that's how long it will take us to get the minimum number of patients in order to see significance. So I think you're absolutely right, Michelle, in that this is going to change the paradigm on infection control because the normal 
way we treated these patients is with uh, substantial antimicrobials, everything from vancomycin that from a C. diff paper at ICAC to um, some of the other drugs that these authors describe in, in their discussions. So, Michael, would that have helped if they had sampled asymptomatic patients and healthcare workers at the hospital? I think it would have changed the way figure four appeared. I think they would have saw that there's a much more random distribution of C. diff amongst the general population. And many of us have at least one each year mm. and we could shed sufficient C. diff spores out of our stool, not as a consequence of C. diff diarrhea, but as a consequence of other diarrheal syndromes, whether they be foodborne or mm. um, some other mechanism. And so consequently, that could be introducing, if you will, new founders into the community and new mm. founders into uh, the population. I think it's a way of C. diff not to become too familiar with our immune system. Mm. Mm. Yeah, because it's constantly, it's almost as if uh, because this is at the whole genome level, we we don't know what it's looking like from a perspective of the proteins, the um, the spots on the microbe. So basically, Michael, if, if if they had sampled asymptomatic people, they would get some additional sources of of the infections, but not all of them, because we think that many of them are also coming from the community, from asymptomatic carriers outside the hospital, and also from food, various food sources as well. So it would be difficult to account for all of them, right? Yeah, it's, it's almost like uh, back to our discussion of ST-131 on the previous TWIM. We're constantly ingesting E. coli ST-131, and it passes through us without any consequence. It's only when we become debilitated in the hospital or go on massive antimicrobials that C. diff rears its ugly head, and once it gets a foothold, it can then cause that pathology. I think the way these authors started the trial is interesting in that they used as their initial toxin, and so that was their selection criteria is the ELISA base toxin assay is what caused them to then culture the stool. Whether or not they would have seen a different result if they just cultured all diarrhea for C. diff, that would have been a much more labor-intensive act, which is why I think it became more manageable for them to screen first with the toxin assay and then from the toxin assay screen those stools uh, for C. diff. So Michael, what fraction, what fraction of the population carries C. diff asymptomatically? Do we know? Um, the, the reported carriage rates in healthy adults has varied from zero to 3% in Europe and up to 15% in Japan. Okay. Wow. So, um, the other interesting thing is we don't know what the infectious dose for a human is. And there have, there was a recent study in AEM by Lowry in which the 100 uh, C. diff spores per centimeter squared that can cause frank disease in uh, mice, and it can go as low as five C. diff wow. spores. Hmm. So, Scary. you know, you don't need very many to trigger uh, the event. And they were looking for disease in these mice, but it's really what is the minimum infectious dose for carriage and how long do we hold on to things? And I think. That's what whole genome sequencing will afford us to do. Right. So right. I think my headset is probably giving up the ghost is the only thing I can think of. Is this your original one that you've had for the life of TWIM? Uh, yes, well, I we think need, so. We need to get you a new one, Michael. I'll, I'll tell Chris to send you one. Okay. So um, I, I'd like to emphasize just how important this study was because, as I said, there, the assumption was that most of the transmission was from patient to patient through healthcare workers, and it's clear that's not uh, the major explanation. And to just emphasize how important this is as a clinical problem, it's estimated in this country that we it costs something like three billion dollars a year um, in healthcare uh, dollars to treat 
patients, deal with patients that have um, C. diff infections. So this is a major clinical problem. Uh, either of you want to comment on the fact that in the paper, they talk about how the number of hospital-connected cases in Oxfordshire decreased from 2008 to 2011, and that they think this is because of stringent hygiene and quarantine practi practices. And can this be implemented? Can this be implemented in the United States? Yeah, they they actually were pointing. I I read in the discussion more toward manage patient management rather than cleaning surfaces, et cetera, uh -huh. um, that That's they're right. uh, being more careful with the use of particular antibiotics that make the patient more susceptible is probably um, the more effective way to prevent disease. I see. But cleanliness does actually sure, sure, sure. help. Yeah. And the fundamental difference between the United Kingdom and the U.S. is we don't use a U.S. At most, we have typically two patients per room and most of the hospitals today, and this will become apparent with the Affordable Care Act clamping down on the 30-day readmit rate, I think hospitals are going to trend towards single patient rooms in order to get reimbursed when a patient is readmitted within 30 days. Hmm. Well, Michael, thank you very much for that. Can I, can I just make one, one other comment? Of course. That, um, this, again, like the paper we talked about on last TWIM, was an interdisciplinary group. Um, so it was a combination of uh, infectious disease specialists, infection control clinicians, nurses, the clinical lab microbiologists, and then specialists in bioinformatics, statistics, population genetics that all collaborated through a consortium they have at the University of Oxford called Modernizing Medical Microbiology. So they've made a, a decision to really invest in this integrative science that can integrate different disciplines and tackle these big problems in infectious disease like C. diff, staph, TB, norovirus. So I think it's, it's exciting and, and certainly the point you made about the cost of sequencing dropping creates new opportunities for using whole genome sequencing for real-time study of uh, infection control and spread in hospitals. This It's all about causality, and I think causality has been heretofore too expensive to to demonstrate because it's it was just buried it down to $30, a, and that's, as Elio said, we haven't seen anything yet. If we can really drive that cost down and you know, the reference genomes um, will become paramount and, and how we define a clinical reference genome will become important. But I think it's, it's just um, the causality of being able to show that the bug I have gotten while hospitalized is very different than the bugs to me got. Michael, there are a couple of other uh, big-time hospital-acquired infections yeah, um, MRSA, MRSA, and VRE, right? Vancomycin resistant enterococci. So, would should they be studied in a similar way? Uh, MRSA certainly should be studied in a similar way, um, because up until this point in time, the best molecular evidence that we have has come out of uh, Barry Chrysler's lab, in which he invented a technology called SPOT, which is looking at one very isolated component of uh, methicillin-resistant Staph aureus, or MRSA. And I think whole genome sequencing will actually uh, begin to do that. And Barry's lab is beginning to move from SPA to whole genome sequencing as, as the price point is dropping. Mm, great. Another success story was um, published about a year ago in Science Translational Medicine, and this was work from uh, a collaboration with Tara Palmer and Julia Segre at the NIH, where there was an outbreak mm. at the NIH hospital of carbapenem-resistant Klebsiella pneumonia, another important nos nosocomial uh, pathogen. And they followed um, the outbreak by doing whole genome sequencing in real time. So as the hospital was dealing with this outbreak, the scientists were collecting the genome sequencing and being able to deduce the chain of transmission and then institute um, infection control procedures. So that's just another example of uh, it's a the great story, actually, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, application of this whole genome sequencing that is faster and cheaper um, to deal with clinical problems. Hmm. That's great. 
All right, let's uh, do a couple of emails before we wrap up here. I have one from Neva who writes, you may have seen this, thought you all might enjoy this heller, header illustration. She sends a link to a blog called The Artful Amoeba. Oh, that's a great site. And uh, great the, site. the header illustration is very funny. It has a, a cell labeled up with vacuole nucleus and then a structure, which looks like a vesicle inside the cell, plans for world domination. <laughs> it's very cool. And there, Leo, this post that she linked to is called The Hidden Beauty of the Horse Dung Fungus. You might oh, like you might like that. Pilobulus. <laughs> Pilobulus. That's a great. <laughs> uh, yes, indeed. Pisolithus tincturus. Pisoli oh yeah. That actually wait a minute, that's not a horse dung fungus. Hey, it's not well, quite right. You better take it up with the author who is Jennifer okay. Fraser. All right. <laughs> Next email is from Dan who writes, Hi, I should give the obligatory love to show, but it is true. As a bioinformaticist of a fairly mathematical sort, it's nice to spend an hour a week really listening to why people care about comparing metagenomic samples, say, rather than just thinking about them as mathematical objects to be manipulated and analyzed. Anyhow, there was a question on TWIM about whether people wearing their scrubs home spread infections from hospitals to other environments. Vincent says people in New York City rarely wear scrubs on the subway there. Regrettably, that's not true here in Ontario. The bus I was riding while I was listening to TWIM stopped in front of our local hospital and on came a woman wearing scrubs and sandals. And he actually sent a picture of this woman, <laughs> which I've linked to in the show notes, and we'll, we'll put a link to. And she is, no, you can't tell who it is, but she's Not got her, her face. She's got yeah. her face, but she's got her scrubs there and sandals. Keep up the good work. Thank you, Dan. And Steve writes, always amused by the repartee on your podcast, especially towards the end. And today I particularly enjoyed the continuation of your banter over washing. It reminded me of a visit to my local hospital, a large one serving a fairly sizable conurbation. I had to go for an ultrasound, which was based in a far corner of the building on an upper floor. I walked all through the building, past many signs about washing hands and the need for cleanliness, and then sat down in a waiting room. As I sat there, I soon became aware of a nasty smell <laughs> and was dismayed to find I had picked up a sizable unwanted fecal donation from what must have been a very relieved dog. With this oh, contribution, no. I left a, filth, a trail of filth through the hospital, and if I were to get up on a gurney, I would transfer it to that, and possible to some of the staff, too. What was I to do? As nonchalantly as possible, I removed my sandal and found its treads firmly plugged with very sticky and smelly mess. So I went in search of a wash basin. There, one, there was one with shiny taps and modern scalloped basin. There were elbow levers on the taps and a large notice on how to wash your hands. The thing was actually a safety design nightmare. The scallop basin was shallow and would slosh and splash the surroundings. The tap outlets were low down on the basin and close to the sides, so you could not put anything like my shoe under them. Anyone washing their hands would likely touch the sides of the basin. What should have been there was a deep, square-sectioned basin with a high-outlet mixer tap delivering a good volume of water into the middle such that hands, forearms, and any objects that happened to need cleaning could be cleansed with a minimum of splashing. But it was much m worse than that. In their wisdom, no doubt, someone had decided that the public could not be trusted with plugs. They had decided they still wanted plugs, so they made a plug that was captive to the outlet grill, a plug that one could not take out but which would fall in when the tap was turned on. Thus, it was impossible to run something like a turd befouled sandal under a stream of appropriately hot water to save a hospital from the infections it carried. But my shoe had to be cleaned. So you can picture the scene trying to get some water from a badly positioned tap onto a mucky shoe while trying to keep a plug from blocking the tiny basin without getting filth on one's self. In the end, there was only one way. I had to fill the basin, put the sandal in it, and scrub at it with paper towels. Then I had to put my hand in the filthy water to hold the plug out while the water drained. Then I had to wash the basin, then my hands, then my hands. Every time you wash your hands in this hospital, you either leave a basin full of dirty water or you dirty your hands again to let the water out. 
with thousands of people traipsing in and out of hospitals without removing their shoes and without putting on masks and hair covers, there isn't a hope in hell of keeping out the germs. Without really well-designed washing and toiletry facilities for both staff and public, there isn't a hope in hell of beating hospital acquired infections love the show steve who is in bedfordshire england where it's rather humid and sticky after a hot sunny day wow tough day i I feel your pain steve (laughs) thank you for sharing all that with us probably more than we need smell his pain (laughs) smell his pain Uh, Let me read one more from Chris. Just before listening to The Last Twim, I had finished reading The Drunken Botanist by Amy Stewart. It is like a garden tour of the liquor store with history, garden tips, recipes, and odd little bits of trivia. On page 59 is a box titled, Warning, Do Not Add Water. It then explains that during Prohibition, California grape growers sold bricks of compressed dehydrated grapes with a package of wine-making yeast. The label warned not to add water and the yeast because it would lead to fermentation, and that would not be legal. So he sends a link to the book's website, drunkenbotanist.com. Now I'm going to try to make homemade grenadine from page 338 from a couple of pomegranates I bought this morning. Thanks for the entertaining listening. We've had quite a discussion of winemaking in the last few episodes we seem to have struck a nerve yeah as we said last time we our listeners really enjoy this we'll have to get some people on who really know all about how to make wine some microbiologists yeah all right that will do it for twim number 66 you can find twim at itunes or at microworld.org slash twim and if you like what we do a good thing you can do to help us is to go over to itunes and rate the show or leave a comment that helps to keep us visible and if uh, you have any questions or comments about what you hear on the show you can email them to us at twim t-w-i-m at twiv.tv and we will be sure to read them on the show and perhaps you'll get an answer Michelle Swanson is at the University of Michigan. Thank you, Michelle. My pleasure. Go blue, huh? You bet. We got <laughs> picked up our fifth win on Saturday. You're a big football mm-hmm. fan? I am. Wow. Football, golf. What else is there? Basketball. <laughs> but Michigan's not so good at that. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> Indiana's better. <laughs> Wait a minute. Who, who was in the national championship game last year? I don't believe the Hoosiers were anywhere to be seen. Wow. Got a little rivalry here. Very nice. <laughs> they made it, but they, of course, lost. Hey, Medical University of South Carolina, how's their teams doing, Michael? <laughs> We're undefeated. <laughs> We're undefeated forever. <laughs> we have no teams. Michael Schmidt, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Vincent. We'll have to get your headset fixed. Yeah. And get you a new one. Elio Schechter is at Small Things Considered. Thank you, Elio. Oh, my pleasure. Of course. And I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I would like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for supporting TWIM and Chris Kandian and Ray Ortega for their technical help. The music that you hear at the beginning and end of TWIM is composed and performed by Ronald Jenkies. You can find his work at ronaldjenkies.com. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology. Okay. Okay. What did you think? Very nice. I, I'm really impressed by the Niceria one. I think... <laughs> <laughs> we couldn't hear you, Michael. That's been the story, Michael. It's, it, it's spooky. That's spooky. You say, I think, and then there's a silence. It's tough. Well, we're going to fix it before next time. Thank you, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.